we're going to be talking a bit about the semantics of that, look at the famous example of something that it uses that. Um, yeah. Okay, nice, here we go. So we're going to be talking about that. And it's not right, it's a really old concept of idea of a semantic layer that goes back to something called OLAP cues, which is super technical, but actually the power of these semantic layers is really interesting. It makes it on top of your table and it gives you stuff. But it's very technical, and so we're going to try and think about it in terms of making sandwiches. That's how we're going to do it. Um, and so the main point of analytics engineering is to get data or some kind of insight into the hands of uh, folks who are end users. Uh, visitors, if you're a small one person data team, then you have a handful of people to serve. And there's a lot of ways to do that. But as you scale, and you're trying to scale your data team, which is something that they're just doing massively, uh, then you have like, a huge number of users to, uh, to get to. And what you need to do is to be able to leverage your data team so that you can start self serving. Which is a dangerous word, but ultimately you want to make sure that your analysts are having to do everything for the rest of the business and there's some way that they can customize their own insights. Um, so, so it's all about getting value in the end from all of the great work that analysts are doing. Um, and, and so it's kind of about where it hits the road. I did the GIFs and I tried using uh, Dali to generate most of these images. Some of them, or one of them, are quite horrifying. Uh, so we'll see. I managed to get around Pokemon because the colors came out on brand. Uh, for Light Dash, which is kind of cool. So, I'd like to do an intro. My name's Oliver. I'm the founder of Light Dash, which is a BI tool that has a semantic layer that integrates pretty tightly with EDT. We're a little baby, we've been around for about a year. Um, actually, we just launched publicly today, which is a complete coincidence. Um, so, yeah, go try it out at lightdash.com. Um, but, yeah, here we go. So here are some Pokemon characters to make a chart. So what I want by the end of this is that people know what a semantic layer is. So if someone comes up to me and says, I think the semantic layer is super important. I think it's a game changer. I think you should put all your money into, into semantic layers. Then um, they don't know what they're talking about. And I'm talking about the pros and cons of that. I also want to convince people that self serving is such a dangerous word. And that it is possible. Um, and maybe we'll create a career into uh, making sandwiches. So I was kind of like, interested in after I went through the, the business model of the making one. Um, so what is a semantic layer and, and why is it off? So this is the best description I found online for this. A semantic layer is, and this is where it's a different way, you can read it, but it's, it's horrifying. It didn't tell me anything about this. This is apparently what a confused Pokemon looks like. Um, and so what I wanted to do was think a bit more about making sandwiches. So I wanted to walk through a thought experiment. And I'm testing this here today for the first time. A big part of like, the problem we're building is when people come to it, they need to learn what a semantic layer is. Or maybe when you have to one more to look at, you want to understand what's the measure and what's the measure. Um, how can I look at my own chart? And how can you move people from that like consuming dashboards world into starting to build something for themselves? You know, start simple, maybe tweak an existing dashboard or a chart, but eventually being able to build that own stuff from some of the quality data that analysts and engineers are pumping out. So you kind of want to educate people and make that easy. Um, and so this is what this is all about. So the idea is, this is what we're going to be, uh, we're setting up a sandwich stand in the bottom of the building. Here's a Pokemon setting up a food truck in the lobby of an office building. Pretty impressive stuff. Um, and the idea is that you need to serve sandwiches to everybody in your organization, and they have to be palatable, they have to be delicious to the person. So you can't serve everyone the same thing. Uh, you can see it's kind of tenuous to be into your daily careers. Um, and you want everyone to get this sandwich on time when they ask for it, and it should be roughly you know, what they want. Um, and you've been provided with all the raw ingredients. So you've got the flour, the yeast, uh, the cheese, the lettuce, whatever you like. <coughs> this will work. Um, okay, so how will we go about setting up the sandwich stand? Well, let's think about day one. We'll make it for them. So here's a Pokemon inside the food truck making a day style sandwich. So every time someone comes to the front, the truck, you say, okay, I'm going to make a sandwich, what do you want? You want a bit of rye, or you want pump in it, or I'll pump that out. It's some hummus, it's some cheese. And what's great about this is all of the workers in the building get exact lunch that they wanted. So they come to you, you're the expert on the ingredients, presumably you're going to make sandwiches because you just staked your career on it, and everyone comes to you and you serve them the sandwiches that they like. And everyone's happy with it. All the sandwiches are extremely high quality, so everyone's happy with what they got. But there are some downsides. There are massive queues and long wait times. So there's a look. Sometimes someone comes and asks for a new bread, like a bagel. You know, like, okay, hang on, let me prep the bagel. I haven't made any bagels yet today, so baking it. So it's, it's pretty much unsustainable. And you're also completely exhausted. 
Because you just get a request constantly. Maybe people were shouting from the back of the line that they wanted a sandwich and it wasn't coming. So it's just not going to scale that well. Um, if you're a small company, it's not worth it. Okay, so day two. And here I dropped Pokemon, which is kind of interesting, and then it became more like this sort of weird business art. It's more like a bit of jazzy cafe sort of situation. Um, but what we'll do is we throw it in the towel and we go, right, you make your own sandwiches. Uh, you're complaining so much. I'll give you the raw ingredients. You know a few things about sandwiches. Um, this is actually where the link between this and data breaks down because most people actually can make a sandwich, but not most people can write SQL query. <laughs> um, so workers, in theory, can make whatever they want. So that's brilliant. So people can um, they have access to all the raw ingredients and they can theoretically get together anything they possibly want to. So there's a lot of flexibility. Uh, and you're free to work on something else. You're free to think about new exciting ingredients that you can bring in, how to upgrade the food truck, how to maybe market it better, and get people using your raw ingredients more. Um, so that's a good thing, you're giving yourself a bit of leverage. Um, but there's a whole load of cons that come from your users on this side, which is that people might not have time to be interested, they just start bringing their own lunch, because like, I'm not going to go down and bake myself some bread. Um, the workers can't find the right ingredients, so it's just all spread out, you don't know where to go for my pickles, I don't know where to go for all these other bits. Well, they can't operate equipment. So someone's had a nightmare with a toasty machine. I know maybe you need people have this. Someone dared to bring in a toasty maker, and one of them comes to mounted. Cheese all over the side. Um, and so the people are like, can't use the equipment properly, or they're not well trained to using the equipment. Uh, and the quality of sound is pretty questionable. Some people come out with remarkable stuff, but most of it's pretty disgusting. Uh, so, so after day two, we figure out giving people the right, one of the raw ingredients that didn't work for us. Um, so then on day three, you think, well, I'm going to curate this kind of buffet for the workers. Where I'm going to pre prepare the rest of the ingredients, so I'll bake loads of different breads, I'll slice all the different ingredients and lay them out, and I'll label them, and I'll make it really easy, as easy as I can, for everyone to build a sandwich mostly the way they like it. I've given them all these prepared ingredients, um, but they don't have to make bread. They don't need these sort of really tricky stuff. Um, I'm an expert on that. And so, there's some pros. Workers can build the sandwich how they like it again, which everyone's happy with. There's a few people with very bespoke sandwich requirements to be like, I'm just not going to cater for that, it's too weird. Um, getting a sandwich fast, there's no use. The people are just writing down your organized buffet and putting together their sandwiches and leaving. Um, and again, you're free to work on something else. So you can think about new recipes, new ways to organize the ingredients, new ways to encourage people to make their sandwiches. Um, but there are, there are a few cons. You have to prepare the ingredients. So you, you need to put some effort in advance of this for everybody to put their sandwiches together. Um, you have to build these great buffets, there's some equipment to sell that um, And so I was just thinking after is how can you sort of prepare the most effective sandwich buffet? How would you lay this out? Um, so you can do something like this. There's a bread picker there, so let's put the breads together. And the interesting thing is people know what bread is. Um, they know what a white bread is, they don't know what a baker is, but they don't know what it makes them up. And they don't need to know what makes them up in this situation because you've made it for them. So they only need this idea of what a white bread is. And they only need this idea of what a baker is, they don't even know how to get there, but they also know how to use it from that point onwards. So we start making these building blocks for the sandwiches. Um, so you create a bread for people, you can put the fillers over here, you can also label stuff, right? So you can have the carnivorous products in one place, so people don't have to question, like, oh, okay. Um, I, I don't want to eat, I don't want to eat anything, uh, meat related, so I'm going to take it for everything else. And then if you put one of them on, you know, kind of those products can go over there. And they don't need to worry about what's underlying or some of the raw ingredients, because you've labeled it and sorted it for them. Got them in small place, fillers, and air drinks, and then maybe let's just keep all the toasting machines in one location. And we'll restrict the ingredients, people really need to those, because you could get a spillage. Um, so essentially, a sandwich buffet. In this example, is a created selection of prepared ingredients that have workers make sandwiches autonomously using some common components that they understand. This is the cheesy bit. Yeah, it's like a semantic layer. So a semantic layer is a business representation of your data that uses terms that your users understand to autonomously access data to a chance to do their own analysis. Probably the most long-winded um, comparison. But I think it's a really powerful idea that if you invest some time into um, Preparing the data, which no other analysis engine is doing with SQL, 
But if you then go to this um, semantic layer, which is kind of one step further, you enable them to just drill into metrics. They can just select metrics, they can select measures, they can start getting insights themselves about how to make SQL. You kind of do them just the right building blocks in order to, to, to serve themselves. Um, and so this is an example of what like, a well-organized data structure might look like. Right? You can have all your orders in one place, the users in another place. Let's keep finance analysis separate because they've got their own requirements. The marketing attribution area is possibly a mess, so let's just let's let them do their thing and pre-join some stuff for them. Um, and the fundraising metrics can go up there because some people care about that. Um, so I thought I'd get into a, a bit of a real example then of what this meant to It's like more of a technical level. So what would I do if I was using a uh, product for the semantic player, whether that's DPT semantic player or something in light dash or whatever? What do I end up doing? Okay. So imagine that you're asked to, eat, to calculate revenue or lead. You can produce the, the, the chart and I give it straight to the user. You decide, okay, we're not doing any more bespoke stuff, it's not scaling. So we're going to make sure we build the semantic as they can do it themselves. So here's what the raw SQL might look like for something like that. We'll get the store name, we'll choose a week. How long is time? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll choose a week, and then there's this complicated thing for revenue. Uh, which is always happens to be the case. There's some weird thing here where if it's in the US, you deduct some tax, but otherwise something up. I don't know why it's discounted by five percent, but it is. Um, that's how it needs to be done. So you, you know you have all this business logic and it's baked into the query. Um, but there's also certain statuses of orders that they can. Um, and you know about that. So you pass the first to say, here's your revenue calculation. Uh, and goodness, you need to try and do this yourself because uh, you, you wouldn't have written the exact same SQL when you didn't have this result. Um, and then they go, okay, well, just show me per month. Yeah, that's like a fairly simple change. You can change it to month. Maybe some users could do that, but definitely on some people's technical uh, skill level. Um, and I've, I've had others already, if you see a lot of code, right, it's, it's not a welcome place to be. Um, I was wondering, okay, well, actually, I'm going to see the top users from like one specific month in that analysis. And so now there's loads to change. I need to change how we're grouping it. I need to change the order of things. A new join has come in because we have to know the, the user ID. And I think these concepts like joins uh, and grouping and things like that, but some people are just fundamentally doesn't feel like their job to understand those concepts. And it's up to us to try to like abstract that away, but still enable them to self-service. How can we get people to do that about having to know what a join is? To know about the, all these foreign keys. It's like half our job. It's like, what, what keys join together? When is the user ID? When is it bad to join that ID to that one? And it's technically the same user ID. You never want the end users to think about that, that those are consuming your data stack. But you do want them to care about things like revenue and top users and total orders. Those are things that they get. The other stuff you want to hide away. Um, and the cool thing is, is that a long time ago, someone realized these queries follow uh, a, a pattern. And SQL is kind of also doing whatever you want. Um, but a lot of SQL queries also have a very similar structure. So we have the metrics area, so in here where we can keep revenue, these are like things you want to calculate or are interested in, like total orders, total users, um, uh, average cost per acquisition, anything like that, that would count as a metric. So there's some mathematics and there's some aggregations going on. So usually you have the raw records and they're all getting aggregated up to produce a metric. You have things that are called, but if you use like this, it's called measures, uh, anything you like. And then you have dimensions. These are the ways that you kind of want to segment or cut the metric. So they show me, in this case, revenue per uh, user, and then they show me the top ones, or so show me revenue per uh, region or geography. And those things that are under per uh, the geography, the user, those are your dimensions. And then you get the filters down below, which uh, again is a kind of way of segmenting. So show me the top users that are only in the US. They're going to look down there. And then down here you have some signing. So I wanted to just see the top 10, or I just want it in a certain order. Um, but then you just have to be able to customize that. Um, but not this. So this part of the query, right, is really not interesting or beneficial to show it to end users. For them to know, this is how everything gets joined together, this is how the foreign keys work. Um, and even the logic in the metric, I think they, they, they wouldn't need to know that. Um, but this is where I started working on the slides on the train on the way here, so they go rapidly downhill. Um, introduce a new semantic layer. So what we could do is we could Take this query here, which has a really similar structure, and where there's the dimension, the next thing, the and styling, and give our end users a way to control 
Those entities could just pick the dimensions that make sense, how they want to cut their data, choose red by metrics that make sense for them on review, um, and be filtered so they can cut the data any way they want, but they're trying to hide away the rest. So we need to use the science there. And this is exactly what the science there does. It's basically a SQL template, if you're not familiar. It generates SQL, uh, but using simpler concepts that people that don't know SQL can use to get kind of the full flexibility of SQL. And you can put them on rails because you can redefine the joints, how the keys map to each other, uh, which filters work well, with which dimensions. Does it make sense to filter all the users uh, by their first touch? That probably makes sense. Does it make sense to do it by, I don't know, the financial, uh, the operating profit for the last quarter? Those wouldn't be compatible. Right? And you can make sure that those kind of mistakes don't happen. And they want to be productive. So this is the marketing slide that I lifted so I was running out of time. But you can imagine that on the left side, um, the engineers, the data team, they can write these metrics, these little SQL snippets. For example, this here, the 95 sum case when, that's the that's abstract that way, and someone can write this snippet. They can declare what the relevant user ID is. It's a huge meaning once you spend the years debating what is the right user ID. You lock it in as one of the dimensions, and you can choose the filters that are relevant to the people as well. And then what happens is, on the UI side or on the API side, you can then start doing integrations or just handing UI to people that make sense, so they can start choosing from relevant curated data um, that makes sense to them. Um, so yeah, I'm going to summarize and finish up. I want to talk a bit about the sandwich buffet. So the, the, there's one thing to take away, is that if you put in some of the early work, you can really give yourself leverage as an analyst. Um, and some of this happens in DET, right? I think there's probably way more people here who are familiar with data transformation. And DET, you know, it's semantized. And it's just one step beyond the productivity gains you already have. So with DET, we start being able to template our queries and start to generate some of these um, kind of analysis really tables for people, right? So they don't shoot themselves in the foot. But there are just some limitations about what you can dynamically do at runtime. And everything's pre joined. You can't, maybe you just add an extra join. Someone just wants to quickly change a quarter to a month. The option's not there unless you create one of those columns individually, um, which is a good use of our time. And so the time goes one step further than what you're doing already in DT uh, to allow people to basically template these simple queries themselves. Um, and so people get what they want, they get the dashboards and the charts that they want for the most part, they get it quickly, uh, and you as an analyst are free to work on other stuff, you can improve the semantic value, you can start getting in more data, work to reduce the latency of the data coming in, because people are asking you for real time. But you do have to prepare those ingredients, and you need to build and curate your buffet. And if there are people here who are BI engineers, your whole job is in the BI uh, space, you will feel this pain, but that's really where the rubber hits the road. So I think those folks, are really dealing with the business users every day. I try to use the phrase business users, the data consumers every day. And it's in there where you're all doing a lot of hard work to make sure that people can self serve and they can use all the work that's getting produced from analysis and engineering team and that's getting pumped to the right people at the right time that they can create it. Um, yeah, so that's the end. Um, I recommend you, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, that you join uh, the Light Dash community. We're small and growing. Um, and yeah, as I was saying, the product is free and open source, by the way, so you download it, run it yourself, and it's basically an open source for the real alternative that's built directly onto the ET. So you've got an ET project, it's one thing, you can get it going. And then you've got a hiring side, we are hiring. So if there are people here who happen to be at an intersection of data and JavaScript, um, and I see that we've got a couple of people, I already spoke to the guys, these people exist, it's like, no, they don't. So I'll just put that a public plea. Um, come speak to me, we're super interested in React engineers, back end engineers, uh, the full stack. We move really quick, we're intentionally small, uh, and we're really taking on a bear model for the very small teams. It's a fun time to join. Uh, so, yeah, that's it.